Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, sitting in on my presentation today. I'm sure it sounds like everyone's telling you it's bloody hard, um, which seems to be the theme of the day, which um, I'm probably not going to change that theme too much, but hopefully uh, give you a slightly different angle on um, product development thinking, really, which comes from other creative industries. But from my point of view, it applies to the games industry, and it, it's certainly something worth thinking about. So. Uh, yes, I run a company called Pixel Blast, which I co-founded about a year ago with my partner, who I used to work with uh, at Activision, a company called Freestyle Games. And we made a game called, uh, or we worked there on DJ Hero, DJ Hero 2, a bit of Guitar Hero, uh, worked for Nintendo as well. And I have quite a varied background, so before then I came from the theatre industry, so I worked in commercial theatre in London, West End. Um, which was a great experience, and actually the games industry and the theatre industry, there's many similarities between them. I think fundamentally the similarity is that we are a creative industry trying to make entertainment, hit-based entertainment. And that's kind of fundamental, really, to underlies everything we do, and therefore we embrace failure, which obviously Andrew was talking about earlier. And failure is not a bad thing. You're going to have it in your time in the industry. But the key thing is, what do you do with that failure? How do you learn from that failure? Um, so yeah, at the moment, we're making a game called Super Power Boy, um, which, from our point of view, it's a budget of about 150000 and we've got investment for this. And we've kind of pushed at the boundaries of that investment. So I think from my point of view, coming from a kind of producer background, um, the point that I always take is get something playable as quickly as possible and get it compelling as quickly as possible. Because then you have the opportunity that you can grow that game or product further in terms of get more investment, get more interest into it. So from a prototype point of view, you're always trying to deliver something that's compelling and um, that you can show to people and they go, oh wow, and the potential of that grows and then someone may give you more money to kind of continue developing it further. Um, now the reason I kind of came into the industry from uh, you know, a relatively well-paid job in a publisher um, is one, uh, uh, philosophically and personally, I wanted to do something myself. Secondary, I wanted to kind of engage with uh, a slightly different aspects of the games industry and actually try and uh, take the opportunity to grow something um, myself with my partner and see if we could do something interesting. And this kind of is old information now. This is like nine months old now, and the, the rate of change in this industry at the moment is just ridiculous. And it's something that I'd advise all of you to keep abreast of. What is the business doing? What are the business mechanics? What are the business templates? What are the, um, how is the business actually moving? You know, you, you're probably aware of free-to-play, of episodic, of premium content, uh, platforms like Steam, mobile, tablets, consoles. Um, all of these have slightly different business mechanics, and they're changing all of the time. Um, again, Andrew touched on them earlier in terms of how much Steam has changed in literally a year. It's hard on Steam now. It's hard on mobile now. It's hard in free-to-play now. Um, whilst a year ago, if you went to an investor with an interesting free-to-play proposition, they'd probably invest in you if you had a good team and a good pedigree, or you, know, you tick some boxes for those investors. Now it's much harder. Um, so I think the key thing from this information, though, that we kind of took at the time was that this figure here is the important figure, the year-on-year -year change. And from a, nine months ago, the console industry, in terms of uh, the number of gamers, it kind of plateaued. Uh, same with handheld, it kind of plateaued. Um, but what really increased, and what's been increasing, obviously, you're more than aware of it over the last few years, is, is tablet games, mobile games, uh, with a huge increase, it's 37% year-on-year increase um, for tablet games, similar over on mobile phone games. And then there was increase in MMOs and uh, casual web games and mid-core PC Mac games, small percentage increase in those. But this was kind of fundamental shift, and it was a huge change. And again, that change affected demographics. People that are now playing games uh, became much more democratic, and much more widespread, um, you now have a potential audience of billions. And they're all different. You know, you can stratify that audience into different demographics. People that play Candy Crush, to people that play Clash of Cans, to people that play Call of Duty, to people that play League of Legends. They're all different groups that you can kind of 
meet with your game ideas or with your business or anything else. So they're really worth thinking about and getting involved in what the business is. Um, interestingly, I, I just always refer to, um, apparently Candy Crush Saga has a female-male split in terms of players of 60-40. And then you look at Call of Duty, which has a female-male split of uh, 10, 10%, 90% male. So that's kind of what's changed. Not only as different types of people, but different sexes are playing games. And it's, it's a really big audience now. So it's worth tracking this stuff and just seeing how these trends keep changing in the industry. Because I promise you, they will change year on year. Um, and it will fuel how you approach your business. Or even if you go and work for a publisher or another studio or whatever, keep abreast of this stuff. Because it is going to be useful for how you... Uh, deal with your career or your business. So I think what you're all trying to avoid is you're trying to avoid being a cog in the wheel and you're all trying to do something interesting. I imagine all of you are creative types in some way. You see yourselves as creatives. So whether you're a programmer, artist, animator, um, you're in this industry because you want to do some cool, entertaining stuff and you want to be creative in the in industry. Um, and that is really a drive that means you'll work really hard even if you're getting paid diddly squat, you'll work really hard still because you've got a passion there. It's almost a vacation what you're doing um, because you're really passionate about it. And really, that's what companies, in terms of my company as a small startup, we want people like that to come on board and have that passion, have that drive. And I have interviewed students who don't have that passion and that drive. And to come into the games industry and not have that um, is just... Is you're, going to, you're going to suffer in it. You can't do this nine to five. You can't just come in and say, oh yeah, I'll do a bit of art for you and what do you want me to do? And not be involved in the project and the game that you're trying to deliver and be passionate about that. Um, so anyway, that's what you're trying to do. You're all trying to avoid being a cog in the wheel, hopefully. And avoid being a silo as well. And I kind of refer to silos quite a bit um, in, in many different ways. So you can be a personal silo, which is kind of, um, that's the nine to five, you know, I'm just going to come in and do my job, I'm not going to engage with anything else. And you're siloing yourself away from your career and ambitions and progress um, in your career ambitions. So certainly you want to avoid personal silos. But I think there's also um, professional silos. I've seen that with people that go to work for publishers. Um, it's, I, did, I did it myself. I worked in a, in a studio that was you know, protected by the umbrella of a publisher for seven years. And when I kind of started to think about leaving, I realized I'd been in a publisher and didn't have a network outside of that publisher at all. All of my network was within that publisher and within that team. And that team was amazing, don't get me wrong, but I realized that if I'm going to break out and do my own thing, I can't rely on that network that I just had within that publisher. So I, I was aware that I had siloed myself over seven years of being within a team and within a publisher, I'd siloed myself off. And that's, I would just avoid that. If you go and work for a publisher, great. But always just expand your horizons outside of that day to day. You know, you might go and work, if you're an artist, you might go and work on Assassin's Creed and be making windows in Parisian buildings for the next two years. You can understand how you're gonna become siloed just within that skill base. You know, if you come out after two years and you've been specifically making buildings in a Parisian setting, that's not really, that's two years where you haven't expanded yourself in any other way. So I think the choice is whatever you do do, um, especially if you go and work within a big publisher or a big team uh, and you can't get involved and you get very niched within that, just look to continue expanding your skill base in other ways. You can also have external silos. So changes in the industry that I was referring to earlier, they can quickly silo you. Um, changes to um, technology can quickly silo you in terms of moving from, you know, that, there was that period five years ago where consoles were kind of really, console teams were, it was a really depressed area and everyone was, studios were closing all over the place for console. Um, and then mobile kind of happened and people that were flexible and had actually looked outside of themselves and looked at the industry made transition to mobile stuff and you got a very buoyant mobile studio um, set up, a lot of mobile studios, a uh, lot of indie developers, um, and it kind of refreshed the industry. And like Andrew again was saying earlier, and I'm trying to point out, these things change quickly though. So 
be aware of what's going on, because then you won't silo yourself through external influences. Um, and organizational as well. Again, that can just be um, publisher-based. You might be run ragged by a publisher if you're a small set studio and just silo yourself in that way. If you go and work in a publisher, you might just silo yourself that way. So just be aware of silos in your life and always try and look outside of those. So there's, there's something in, um, in other industries, in other creative innovation industries, that we don't really deal with in games, that I think is worth engaging with, and I think it will really help you, which is um, the notion of innovation and product development. And there's lots of thinking in other companies around how innovation works and how creating stuff works, creating stuff that people want to engage with, product development, how all of that works. And um, companies like Lego have an amazing innovation process in order to keep generating new product developments and new ideas within the Lego uh, brand. And their system is really quite stratified uh, and it's really worth looking at. Same with Apple, same with the people at uh, Gore that make Gore-Tex uh, fabrics. If you ever bought a decent waterproof coat, if you go hiking or something, Gore make thousands of different products within their kind of plastic type industry and they're always trying to innovate stuff around that and they have a very good process as well. And I think what I wanted to touch on today is a couple of principles, well that's kind of gone a bit long, is a couple of principles around innovative thinking that you can go away and read about afterwards and I think they'll be really useful uh, as you go forward in your career whether you just go for a career in a, another studio or publisher or you set up your own business. Um, so the first principle is constraints. Um, a lot of companies talk about constraints, a lot of innovation thinking and books and studies talk about constraints. Constraints are really important. Um, now, when I talk about these things, I'm talking about them from a macro and a micro level. You can apply them in all different areas. Um, the picture here is of uh, two-track, four-track and eight-track recording processes that are kind of famous with the Beatles and Beach Boys and uh, Pink Floyd. And basically those machines only allowed you to lay down four tracks. Uh, so if you're using the four track, you could lay down four tracks of music. And you couldn't just put a whole band in a room and record on one track because the noise would come out terrible because the recording equipment wasn't decent then either. So within that kind of four track recording, um, EMI gave the Beatles carte blanche to go into Abbey Road. And the Beatles started to poke at what you could do around these four track machines. And within that, they started to do really interesting stuff musically within that constraint. And that constraint in terms of like uh, harmonization, um, laying down multiple instrumentations onto one track and how far you could push that before you got distortion. Um, all that stuff led to some of the Beatles' great albums. And the same with the Beach Boys in the States. And that was kind of going on in parallel at the same time. And that was a constraint that they worked with in order to be creative. Now, if I ask some of you today, hey, draw me something I like, and I give you all a sheet of paper, you'll be like, what, the, what, what am I going to draw you um, that you're going to like? And you'll all come to me and you'll give something to me and my subjective way, I'll go, oh, that's, yeah, okay, don't really like that. And you'll feel a failure, but obviously you haven't failed because I've just been awful manager-wise in terms of giving you a framework that you can work within. And if I said to you, look, I really like dolphins, can you draw me a really cool dolphin? Then the more likely it is, more of you are going to get and give me something that I'm going to like. So that kind of constraint isn't a negative thing, it's a positive thing. And so you, it's worth thinking about constraints. And these don't just carry across uh, creative thinking, but they also carry across just your business thinking as well. So, you know, this is the fundamental constraint of any game business or any business fundamentally. Um, but if you're making a product, time, cost and scope, they're your constraints. Um, you can push at these and see what you can do within them. You might be able to increase your budget or get more funds in, then you can increase your scope. But fundamentally, that's the constraint you're working within. And that's going to dictate your creative output as well. And you've got to think about your game and your product within those constraints. So certainly within, um, sometimes there's conflict within, certainly I've had in the past, where people see the stuff as like, well, this is not do with the creative process. You know, I'm a creative and I'm going to do this cool stuff. But this is fundamental to the creative process. Um, if you do have a, a bigger team and you have a producery type person, the likely it is they're chipping away at um, 
I always refer to like Peter Molyneux, who's, who's obviously come in for criticism late, uh, lately, but he's kind of come out there. Um, and I enjoy watching him in interviews and talk about stuff, but I'm always aware he's an ideas person. He throws stuff into the mix and you know, it's often down to a really good team to kind of go, okay, let's, let's framework that and contain that Peter Molyneux force of creativity. But that's what he's great at. But when he's kind of started his own studio, I think he kind of, um, it, he was away from that kind of publisher of Microsoft and everything else and he just got a bit exposed because he's an ideas person. And recently that studio has been making changes to kind of bring in more business people or bringing people that kind of will just try and constrain um, that kind of ideas person into, well, let's not do that, but let's definitely do that because that's going to be great. And, but I miss him. I miss him because it's, it's fascinating to see that kind of person publicly speaking out there. So these are kind of creative constraints as well. So you have your business constraints. You also have your creative constraints. There's a great book called Imagine by Jonah Lira um, that is worth reading. It's a very small book. Um, but really, the principle of it is, is constraints are liberating. Um, so embrace constraints and read around them. And I think you'll kind of understand why this, from an innovation and a product development point of view, constraints are so useful. Um, the other thing is, sorry about the text. So I don't know, this, this is like 20 years ago, or I don't know, maybe younger, uh, Older people might know it, but there was a show called Whose Line Is It Anyway, which is kind of still in the States. And coming from a theatre background, um, and I usually talk about these two things slightly differently, collaboration and networking, but I've kind of amalgamated them because of time. But coming from a theatre background, um, I used to do kind of acting and thought of being an actor, I used to do improv. And from a collaboration point of view, if you're in a team and you have a good team, collaboration is the most important thing for your team in terms of just delivering something that is compelling. There's kind of myths that exist in creativity about uh, people on a pedestal and people that are, you know, there's the creative person over there and we all just do what he says. But actually, and this is again something that other industries have grasped, creativity comes from collaboration between a team and you're all contributing to the delivery of that game or that product or that creative thing and therefore you're all contributing to it. And there's no... You know, you all have roles within it, you all wear hats in terms of delivering that. But it's, it's respectful of making sure that within a team you don't think there's this one guy there and he's the creative. And you get confabulation in this industry, you know, where people uh, present themselves uh, from either a PR or branding point of view. Mike Bithell does it in a way, you know, Mike Bithell, it's a Mike Bithell game. Many people have helped Mike Bithell make a game and he readily admit that himself as well. But he is, obviously the Mike Bithell brand is it's a Mike Bithell game. So he's created it all. Um, and that's part of his delivery to you know, make access into the market. But I, he's more than aware than anyone else that his thing, his games come about through collaboration. So from an improvisation point of view, it's fascinating because the trust you need in improvisation, it's a really good lesson. There's another book called um, uh, Group Genius by Keith Sawyer, I think. And this talks about, it uses improvisation as an example. Um, if I... I'm in a group of actors and I say, ah, oh, my eye. The world is open completely about what in the hell the context of me saying that is. I don't define that though. The actors around me now define that. And I say, yes, that arrow came across really fast. And then you're starting to build a picture. And then other actors will start chipping in. And that actor that originally said, oh, my eye, he didn't know that someone was going to say, ah, oh, it's an arrow that shot me in the eye. But now he's got another piece of information in order to work forwards with and create a context. And that context grows and grows and grows. And what we used to say in, in acting point of view was, it's getting fat. Um, and when uh, a drama teacher used to say to you, it's getting fat, that was a point in time where someone would try and step in and change the tone because you had either been repeating the same idea or you kind of got caught in this loop that was kind of getting fat and, and unwieldy. And so the drama teacher would say, it's getting fat, and then someone else would have to bring something new in. And the actors would work together to build this picture. And so Keith Sawyer uses it really to kind of exemplify collaboration and why it's so important. And 
it kind of, again, ties back to a lot of innovation thinking. Agile Scrum, if anyone here is talking about Agile Scrum today, this is the fundamental of Agile Scrum processes. It's not a project management process, although it is. It's also a collaboration process. And the thing about Agile Scrum is it also believes that everyone on that team is taking ownership for delivering something cool and is committed and passionate about doing that. And therefore, you know, if someone sees something's broken, they go, oh, someone else will fix that. They actually go, how can I fix that? Um, because they're all believing in the product they're making. So these kind of principles are, are really, um, really important. And I think the reason it can be tied to, uh, is that coming out? Okay, yeah, sorry about all this. This is weirdly compressed. Um, but the reason it's so important from a networking point of view, and networking has multiple strands that are worth thinking about in your career. I'm sure uh, careers teachers or your courses have all said, get out there and network. Meet people, talk to people, grow your network. And that's a really good high level piece of advice, but networking goes far, far deeper than that. There are many different networks you should build, um, whether you're starting your own business or you're just going into a career uh, working for other people. Um, and those kind of networks really, the point of a network is so you have lots of dots floating around and at some point you can join those dots. So if you are, if you think a bit about it from a creative point of view, um, understanding what the games industry, the type of products out there, the types of different games, even the types of business mechanics we were talking about earlier, free to play, Steam, premium, uh, episodic, experience with all of those uh, genres and business principles to do with delivering games. Your awareness of those means when you're thinking about your game, you can start joining dots for your product in terms of what the best routes to take. And oh, actually, yeah, I saw that thing years ago and that was really well done. And then you connect that dot and you apply it to your game. You know, Steve Jobs always talked about ideas are just um, rehashes of other people's ideas. And that is true. Um, you know, no one, I had a conversation the other day about someone that was involved with Tetris years ago. And he was basically saying, I'm now involved with something 30 years later that I believe is completely original. And this guy had worked on much stuff in that 30, 40 year period. Um, but it, it, from working on Tetris years ago to doing something now, he didn't really believe that he'd actually created any, or been working on anything that was truly, truly, truly innovative. Because actually what you're doing is you're absorbing ideas and representing them. And that's usually what happens with most people's games. You're not doing anything truly unique, but the presentation and the amalgamation of ideas into something else is unique. And it's the same with music. We all use music to actually piece bits together. Um, but chords and notes and all of those things, same with words, all these things exist, right? But it's the way you put them together that creates something unique. Um, so joining dots is, a, is a, a really good thing to think about when building your networks. And this is kind of how it looks. Um, you build up all this knowledge base and then when the time comes to it, you take all that knowledge base and you start connecting dots and then that does lead to creativity. And it's a really, um, networks you can build can be all sorts. So there are creative networks, like I said. There's business networks. Um, there's networks across people and ideas and industries. Certainly coming from a theatre industry, I think helped me tremendously um, coming to the games industry because there was stuff that the theatre was doing that games wasn't doing that made it interesting to think about. I think when I came to the industry, there wasn't much freelance work going on. There wasn't much um, kind of contractors. And there's many more contractors now. Um, and that has kind of carried on growing. But theatre works from the basis. Everyone is freelance. Everyone's a contractor, basically. Everyone has a fixed role for a fixed amount of time to do a fixed thing, and then they all go away and do something else. And that dynamism in theatre kind of doesn't exist in games. And it was hard for existing games when it was console-based, but now that actually doing indie stuff, doing small stuff, is kind of more prevalent. It's made contractors uh, able to exist much more fluidly and much more successfully within this industry at the moment. And that may actually change. Um, I won't talk about that. So from a networking point of view, um, this is a scene from uh, Apollo 13 when they're basically saying, we've got to fit that into that, using only that. And ideation is another principle of, of kind of product development and thinking that is um, 
not just about how to generate ideas, but how ideas get formulated and where they actually come from and how they kind of uh, come about. And there's kind of two books that talk about this um, that are kind of worth reading. Um, they're not really high level. They kind of try and get into techniques, especially think, uh, thinker toys. Um, but they, all, they both talk about this kind of five-stage process of identify, prepare, instruct, incubate, or insight, or that other one over there. The principle being is going back to that kind of uh, making dots and network picture. You start off as a business um, absorbing loads of different stuff, absorbing loads of different ideas, trying to get involved in other people's teams and meeting other people, etc., etc. The wider your network, the more creative you can be. And those, this is called a preparation time. We all do it. If you woke up this morning um, and you probably went, oh, what am I going to have for breakfast? My choices are I can have this, um, I can have grapefruit with some Weetabix and milk, oh, but the grapefruit often kind of curdles the milk in my stomach, so I won't have the grapefruit, I'll have an apple with my Weetabix instead. You're going through that kind of five-stage process that looks more like that. You're kind of, and I'd rather this was a funnel really, but fundamentally you've got loads of ideas, you wake up, you've got lots of choices, and you kind of start exploring them and making connections and grouping them up into things that you're going to enable to make you lead to a choice. Now that's pretty much the same in the creative process. If you're in a studio and the studio's kind of like, hey, we need a new game idea, what are we going to do? Um, you're going to start exploring lots of different ideas. Now, this goes back to the framework stuff and constraints. You're not just going to explore like random ideas, you're going to give yourself constraints. Right, let's make the best platform game that's ever been released. Uh, that has first-person shooting in it and some MMO aspects. Um, that might be your framework, crazy as that sounds. And so you'll start exploring around that and pulling ideas and actually going to play other games and, and starting to feed this area here where you've just got this openness of ideas. And then at some point, you're going to have to sit down and go, OK, how are we going to uh, formulate actual routes forward with that? So you'll join dots, you'll join themes, pillars. Um, and then you'll start to actually close those at the end. And when you're closing them, that might be a prototype process. Um, that might be just actually a design process. You're doing that pretty much uh, for product development. You're also doing it in your life. You're doing this in your life all the time. You're doing it for your career. Um, you're probably either graduating or about to graduate, so you're probably thinking, the world is my oyster, I have all these things that I could be doing, how am I going to do them? You're opening yourself up to lots of different ideas. You're then going to go through this process of what's the best thing for me? Well, I kind of want to make sure I'm doing, uh, having my own company in five years' time, so maybe I should go and work for another indie developer who's kind of up and coming. And so you'll start making those connections and then you'll make a choice and then you'll go forward with it. So this kind of process that's talked about in innovation thinking can apply across your life. And to kind of understand it, and read about it. Um, we don't really look at it uh, kind of formal stuff in relation to the game industry, but I think it's worth going to other industries where there is formal thinking around this stuff and just reading about it, because then it starts to inform the games industry and your careers and your businesses in it. Um, so this is another funnel. We use this kind of funnel all the time. We do it in production. I'm a producer. Um, I won't talk about it too long, but basically you do the same thing. You start with a bunch of ideas, and as a producer you just try and chip, 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 chip. You might make scope decisions, strip stuff away, you know, producers are known as strippers of features, and then you release. Um, so funnels are like, funnels are the most important, one of the most important shapes in the games industry. Um, from another point of view, from a kind of... Um, I think it goes back to knowing your team and knowing what hats your team is wearing, especially if you're a young business. I have this problem. I, I know what my hat is, or I have multiple hats, because we don't have a, a fully cross-disciplined team that we probably need, to be honest. Certainly the game we're making at the moment probably could do with a few more roles that we don't have. So therefore our team is filling those roles by wearing hats of different people. Probably not as best as someone else could do, but that's just the situation you're in. And so we clearly try and define what those roles are for people. And I think going back to that kind of communication um, and cooperation within teams, it's important you understand how people are creative within your team. And there's a, a book called The Ten Faces of Innovation, which is by a guy called Tom Kelly, who runs a 
design and innovation agency called IDEO, which is kind of world renowned for being um, uh, an agency that does product development for other companies. And they've got, again, these really good innovation processes um, in order to kind of think around and how to cre create new stuff. Um, but they're very clear on what roles are. There's all different types of roles. So a director is like Peter Molyneux. He's the big picture thinker, comes up with ideas. A producer might be the, uh, the hurdler, um, problem solver, optimist, gene the team up. I think you read this and again you carry it across to, I certainly carry it across to what are the strengths of my team? And how can I focus that team down to what their strengths truly are? Um, so again, it's, it's worth kind of engaging with. And I think fundamentally, um, and I'm wrapping this up now, fundamentally, just be prepared to fail. I mean, I'd engage with any of this kind of innovation thinking that is in other industries. It's really, really useful. And then f the principle being just embrace failure. And again, that's what all of these innovation companies talk about is you've got to embrace failure, you've got to embrace it quickly, um, and just enjoy failing, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, but it is so important to learning. And again, it's so important to your studio, if you're running your own studio, it's so important to your career. Um, if at any point in your career you think, hey, I've made it, going back to things change, don't hold, ever hold that attitude. Always be learning, always be growing your network. Um, and always be looking to make connections and do new stuff. And all of those kind of principles that I've kind of talked about today are, uh, are kind of all cross-pollinated with each other. So just, yeah, don't be afraid to uh, fail, essentially. So that's it. So if you want to refer to the kind of books that I might have referred to today, and I've kind of got a list, it's the only time I've actually used Pinterest, um, just for today. Um, that's kind of the line where I've kind of put the, the references to books that I've put up there today. So feel free just to copy that down and, and look at that Pinterest board. Um, but otherwise, yeah, any questions at all? Um, yeah, any questions? <coughs> okay. Lots of, lots of questions. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. A massive round of applause.